Over the past decade, we've seen streaming services become an important part of film distribution. So many acclaimed films from respected auteurs have been funded and released on streaming platforms, and have given us access to so many gems. And yet, for some reason, cinephiles, and even some filmmakers, still hold a snobby attitude towards this method of distribution, and see it as the equivalent of direct video releases back in the day. I completely disagree with that assessment, and while I certainly love and cherish the theatrical experience, I found myself becoming a major supporter of the streaming model in recent years. I'm going to start by focusing on the big dog of streaming, Netflix. This was the company that really changed the game in terms of proving this was a valuable way to provide entertainment to viewers, and they've done a superb job of this. Everyone who's entered the streaming landscape is basically following in Netflix's footsteps. Their model primarily seems to involve spending a massive amount of money producing and acquiring a lot of films in the hopes that some will stick and become a big deal. Netflix has released a variety of productions, ranging from big action movies to animated family movies to prestige films of awards potential. I've seen complaints about how Netflix seems to value quantity above all else, but there's a reason they release so much. The service has over 200 million subscribers worldwide. That's a lot of different demographics with their own unique tastes, so Netflix has to cater to all of them. They cannot just produce things like Merit Story or Mank. They also need movies like Red Notice and Over the Moon and Sandy Wexler. Netflix actually reminds me of Disney during the 90s. During that decade, Disney distributed a wide variety of movies under their multiple labels. They had family movies in the Walt Disney Pictures banner, while independent movies were usually handled by Miramax. Meanwhile, there was a steady diet of comedies, romances, horror films, and action movies distributed under the Touchstone Pictures, Hollywood Pictures, and Dimension Films brands. The idea behind this distribution plan was they appealed to as many demographics as possible, all of whom craved specific types of movies on the chance that something hit. Netflix operates on a similar philosophy. There were a lot of gripes about Netflix upending the theatrical distribution model before the pandemic led to changes at traditional Hollywood studios too, but they're now more similar to classic Hollywood companies than we give them credit for. As studios shift more towards tentpoles, Netflix has become a home for the kinds of adult dramas film buffs complain the bigger studios don't make as often. Martin Scorsese's The Irishman was originally set up at Paramount, with STX handling international distribution. However, Paramount dropped out, and who came to the rescue? Netflix. Despite the pedigree of Scorsese, Robert De Niro, and Al Pacino, I'm not sure a three-and-a-half-hour gangster drama about Jimmy Hoffa would have done particularly well at the box office. While the film is given a one-month exclusive theatrical run to appease Scorsese, the movie very likely found a much bigger audience on Netflix than if Paramount and SDX had given it a typical theatrical release. Even though David Fincher has directed a number of hit movies, I don't think many studios were terribly interested in making a black-and-white historical biopic about the co-writer of Citizen Kane. Netflix then stepped up to finance and release make. The film reportedly did not attract many viewers, but Netflix does not seem too upset by that, as they got the Oscar nominations they wanted and have continued to work with Fincher on new projects. Something I'm especially pleased to see from Netflix is their commitment to animation. Animated films regularly do well on the platform, and so they've invested a lot in attracting high-profile talent and funding their dream projects. Sergio Pablos had been trying for years to find someone to finance Klaus, but kept getting turned down. Eventually, Netflix decided to produce The Yuletide Tale, the first movie under the Netflix animation banner. Without the streamer's support, it's possible Klaus would never have gotten made. Similarly, Guillermo del Toro had been attempting for several years to find an interested party in its stop-motion animated adaptation of Pinocchio. Around the time he was promoting The Shape of Water, Del Toro revealed that the movie would likely never happen, as nobody was interested in funding it. That was until Netflix came a-calling and agreed to make the movie on his proposed $35 million budget. Henry Selleck also had a hard time getting his projects off the ground, with one even being cancelled by Disney during production. Thankfully, his new film, Wendell and Wild, is set to be released this year by, you guessed it, Netflix. Artiman has also set up a deal with the streamer for the upcoming films, which will likely get them a bigger audience than their last few theatrical releases did. If you are an animation fan, you should be ecstatic about many of the animated films being greenlit by Netflix. Of course, they're no longer the only game in town. Disney Plus has also become a major streaming service, with around 130 million subscribers worldwide, even though it's a much younger platform than Netflix. I've also been impressed with what they've accomplished. While there have been a few hiccups, like the cancellation of the Lizzie McGuire revival series, they've done quite nicely, including on the film side. 
While Disney's theatrical slate has largely shifted towards tentpoles, Disney Plus has allowed them to make traditional mid- and small-budget films again. Before Disney Plus launched, one of the higher-ups said that the platform would be a great opportunity to produce the kinds of films they would otherwise reject in favor of bigger productions. One of my favorite Disney Plus original movies is Flora and Ulysses, about a comic book-loving girl who befriends a squirrel. This was a really charming and clever family movie, but also the sort Walt Disney Studios moved away from when films like Alexander and The Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day did not make as much as the remakes or the superhero movies. If they did not have Disney+, Plus, I doubt the studio would have approved it for production. Ditto films like Safety, Stargirl, and the upcoming Better Nate Than Never. The service is also why they're still going to make Disney nature documentaries after the box office grosses started going down as well as anticipated sequels to Hocus Pocus and Enchanted, and an animated film adaptation of Judy Bloom's Superfudge. Something that seems to have annoyed people is a decision to ship films like Turning Red and Luca from theatrical to a streaming release. This is apparently seen as some sort of punishment, particularly towards Pixar, but it's not really. First of all, we're still in a pandemic. Secondly, as you can see, many prestige films have been released and gained a wide audience on streaming platforms. Being released directly at home has not affected their claim or popularity at all. It was even recently revealed that Luca was the most watched film on any streaming service last year. The fact that Luca beat out highly watched films like Don't Look Up and Red Notice is really impressive and shows the drawing power of the Pixar brand. Nobody thought less of Luca because they could see it immediately on Disney Plus rather than watching it on the big screen. Another animated movie that was initially slated for theatrical release but proved incredibly popular on streaming was The Mitchells vs. The Machines. I don't know how that would have fared if Sony stuck with a theatrical release, but it was a phenomenon on Netflix early last year. Far more people also had access to Wolf Walkers than any previous Cartoon Saloon movie on original release because it was streaming on Apple TV+. At this point, it should be obvious that a director streaming release is not a lesser form of distribution. Would it have been nice to experience turning red on the big screen? Yes, it would have. I have a lot of fond memories of seeing the newest Pixar movie in theaters. However, I also think it's wonderful that people, especially those who are not comfortable going to theaters or taking their children, will be able to watch it at home. What I find baffling is that so-called animation fans have this sudden disgust towards streaming now. I don't know where this comes from, especially what I talked about earlier regarding Netflix and what they're doing for animation. Disney is making the film available on one of the world's most popular streaming services. So many people are going to watch Turning Red next week, including people who are even more willing to give it a chance. A complaint I've seen about streaming services is that a large number of them now means it's just going to be cable all over again. However, what you can accomplish with streaming is what I've been saying cable should have been doing for years. I've long felt that cable companies should allow you to pick and choose what channels you want rather than pay for ones you'll never watch. Streaming gives you that choice. There are the services I'm subscribed to year-round, namely Netflix, Disney+, Plus, and Criterion Channel, as they continually provide me with movies and shows that interest me. At one point, Apple TV+, Plus added a few things I wanted to watch. So I subscribed, watched the things I was interested in, and then canceled before the next billing date. It was so simple and easy, and all it took was a couple of mouse clicks. Then the next time Apple releases something I'm really keen to see, I'll do the same thing again. I admit there was a time when I considered theatrical a far superior release model to streaming or video on demand. When Universal announced Trolls World Tour would be given a VOD release rather than delaying its theatrical opening, I was initially against it. Why couldn't they just wait until the pandemic calmed down, I thought. Of course, back then I assumed it would only last about three months. Did not quite turn out that way. However, after over a year of watching new movies entirely at home, that really changed my perspective on things. You would think others would come to realize the same, and that there's value to releasing a film on a streaming service. We're in an age where people have far greater access to films they probably would have taken months to see because they opened in another city, or had trouble finding international distribution. They're now arriving at home quicker or being funded by big companies like Netflix or Apple, willing to spend the money on these smaller movies with potentially niche appeal. It's wonderful seeing movies on a big screen, but a film is not less distinguished because it requires a login and an internet connection to watch. I've been impressed with what these streaming services have brought us since they started popping up, and I'm looking forward to what the future brings. See you next time.